Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Thank you so much for joining us, friends. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we thank you so much, Lord, for your gracious mercy towards us, for your wisdom, Lord. Lord, bless us to hear your voice always, Lord. He said, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. Lord, that's what we desire. We desire to hear your voice, follow you. And, Lord, bless us today to understand your plan of evangelism. We know that you're about to start the greatest evangelistic move the earth has ever seen. And, Lord, we are overjoyed to live in the age when this comes. We want to see the blessing of your people. It is so pronounced in the Scriptures, Lord. We're so happy to hear about it. It's uh, it's going to bring joy to all hearts and uh and uh, quite a uh, witness to a lost world. Once again, your power, Lord, and we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing today. Amen. Okay, I want to start in um, Isaiah chapter 40, and uh, you'll find that it's quite a, an evangelistic chapter. And you notice I'm going to bring you up on something that we studied here recently in this plan of evangelism, and that is that there's two different things we can see. We can see lost coming into the kingdom, a people that God foreknew to be a part of Zion, spiritual Zion, from the foundation of the world, and we can call these people the lost sheep of the house of Israel, because they are. On the other hand, there are those who have come into the kingdom in spirit and yet they are still the lost sheep of the house of Israel much like natural Israel was when Jesus came because they don't know about discipleships they don't know about uh, bearing fruit and they are the lost sheep of the house of Israel so these two groups of people fit very well this prophecy and uh, as we look into it we'll see the great promises that are involved here In 40 and 1, he says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. How many Christians do you know that are suffering some kind of torment, some kind of trial, some kind of tribulation. And they've been doing it for a long time, and um, they're wondering how long are we going to go through this. How many do you know? I I, I grant it, there will be quite a few. There's quite a few that I know. But God is saying through what proves to be initially the John the Baptist ministry or the Elijah ministry, Uh, to comfort his people who have been suffering, that their warfare is accomplished, that they can rest, that they can trust in God, that now things are about to change, that her iniquity is pardoned. You know, there's good news to give to people. The good news is that their iniquity is pardoned. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're told in verse uh, from 17 on down. Well, I'm going to start in verse 16. It says, Wherefore, we henceforth know no man after the flesh. No man after the flesh. This includes anybody that you would pass on the street that you wanted to share the gospel with. Or this includes any confused Christian who has never really heard the gospel. No, no man after the flesh. Even though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now we know him so no more. Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. 
this is a promise we can give to those that are lost, and it's a promise that we can give to those who are, quote, saved. Even while they're very confused about God's plan, and uh, they're like what Jesus called the lost sheep of the house of Israel, or the lost sheep of the house of spiritual Israel. He's a new creature. Now, this is, of course, a spoken word of faith. Uh, a spoken word of faith on the basis of the gospel. He's a new creature. The old are passed away. Behold, they are become new. So, everything that was no longer exists according to the faith of the gospel. We call the things that be not as though they were. We confess that we have been set free in Christ, that our old man was crucified, and we don't live anymore. Christ lives in us. But all things are of God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So this is something that's been accomplished. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not reckoning unto them their trespasses just as we read in Isaiah 40. Not now. So when we go to minister to the confused or the totally lost, we are to not, we are to share the good news with them that Christ reconciled them unto himself. The good news that their trespasses have been forgiven they are not reckoned unto them. It goes on to say, and having committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So this is what we're supposed to share with people, the good news, the happy news. And don't you know, Jesus has reconciled you to God. You are delivered from the curse. You are a new creation. Old things have passed away. So few Christians understand this. It's a very encouraging word that God will use that faith to bring it to pass. And the reason they struggle uh, so much with all of their failures is because they do not believe that this has actually happened. So we are ambassadors, therefore, on behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating by us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ. Be ye reconciled to God. In other words, just accept this free gift of reconciliation. And so instead of judging the lost, you leave that up to God, you know, because God judges those that are without, the Bible says. It forbids us to judge those that are without. You leave that totally out of the situation when you're talking to the lost. You want to share with them the good news, the gospel which is the power of God unto salvation. The good news of reconciliation. We are ministers of reconciliation. In other words, when we speak this good news to them, when they believe it, there is reconciliation accomplished. Okay. So that's what that's what our job is when we preach the law. Now, now I know and you know that there are people out there screaming on street corners, what a bad sinner you are, and you're going to hell, and all this other stuff. But you know that's not what we're commanded to do. We are to be weak unto the weak. We are to not judge the lost. We are to share with them the reconciliation, the really good news. You'd be surprised how many, these people that are doing this, would be surprised how many people would slow down, stop, and listen, rather than quickly walk, walk past them, or quickly roll up their windows as they drive by, or, you know, just don't want to hear it. And these people are not ministers of Christ. They have their own selfish ambition and they're out there on their own. You know, Jesus said, if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. So many people have gone in their own name. They haven't gone in the name of Christ. The Bible says in verse 21, him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And working together with him, we entreat also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So, in other words, this 
will do this reconciliation that was accomplished by Christ will do you no good unless you believe it. This is what God is asking. And of course, when we go out and share this good news of reconciliation, the ones that believe it, they're of God. They've been foreknown of God from the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible says. We're just going out there to find these lost sheep. And when they believe what we say, we found one, you know, <laughs> and on and on. So back in, uh, in Isaiah 40, this is the first thing that comes out is reconciliation. Your iniquity is pardoned. God has forgiven you. Think about when Jesus came just after John the Baptist and uh, who pronounced the Isaiah 61 acceptable day of the Lord. Think about the stubborn, self-willed Jews that he went out there and healed everybody that came to him. Think about the acceptance and the reconciliation that God was imputing to these people. Well, we're coming to just such a time. We spoke about the suffering that many of God's people are going under right now. It says, as a matter of fact, it says right here that they received double uh, for all their sins. And I'm sure there are people out there that feel that way. I've been going through this misery for so long. Lord, are you even hearing my prayers? You know? Well, yes, he is. So don't be double-minded. Hold fast. God's got a plan of evangelism. It's going to start with the John the Baptist. It may have started already, as a matter of fact. And um, that's going to be followed up with the man-child ministry. So, verse 3 says, uh, The voice of one that crieth, Prepare ye in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Make level in the desert a highway for our God. And, of course, this is right out of Matthew chapter 3, in verse 3, where it says, for well, this is he that was spoken of through Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make you ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And it was speaking of John the Baptist. And it's also speaking of John the Baptist in uh, Malachi chapter 3, where it says, Behold, I send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. Uh, that is the coming of the Lord. You know that the Lord is coming in our day, according to Hosea 6, 2, and 3. He's coming as the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says there. On the morning of the third day, which is where we are now, the third thousand-year day from Jesus Christ. So he says, Behold, I send my messenger. That's the messenger of the Lord. This is John, the Baptist, or the Elijah ministers. And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And as you know, that's that happened in Jesus' day, and it's going to happen in our day, because the Lord is going to come as the latter rain, um, and the first people to receive the latter rain, the first fruits to receive the latter rain, as you know, is going to be the man-child ministry. First fruits in Jesus' day was the man child ministry of that day, Jesus himself, and the first fruits in our day is the first fruits to have Christ in you, the hope of glory, manifested in them, and he's going to suddenly come to his temple. Uh, the anointing that came upon John came upon him six months before the anointing came upon Jesus, when God suddenly came to his temple by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the messenger of the covenant whom you desire, behold, he cometh, says the Lord of hosts. But who can abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi. Now this is a greater ministry than John the Baptist by far. That's the, the man-child ministry, just as Jesus ministry was greater than John's, so this one will be, and uh, you know, the Lord said, previously, I'm going to back up just a little bit and point something else out to you, it says, but she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins, you know, the Lord has a plan of evangelism, and the first thing is, is that many people will recognize themselves as sinners. 
in Nehemiah uh, chapter 9, we see, I think, a series that happens over and over and over. Uh, verse 26 says, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their back. And this is exactly what's happening today, folks. The word, the people of the Lord are casting his law behind their back for many different reasons, either because they have a selfish desire, self-will, uh, religious spirits, uh, idolatry. Uh, they're casting the Lord's word behind their back and uh, holding something up, be it religion or, like I said, religious spirits higher than himself. Uh, opinions of men higher than the word and slew thy prophets that testified against them to turn them again unto the yes and they still persecute and slay with their tongue uh, the prophets of God and they brought great provocations therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their adversaries who distressed them and he said that they had paid double for all of their sins and that is, of course, being delivered over to the adversaries and who distressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their adversaries. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee, Therefore leftest thou in the hands of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest from heaven, and many times did thou deliver them according to thy mercies. He sent them saviors. Uh, how many times has he sent them saviors? When the Savior came, Jesus came, it was because God's people were crying out to him in bondage. When Moses came, they were crying out to God in bondage in Egypt, oppressed by the Egyptians. And just as God's people today are being oppressed by the Egyptians, the old man, under the bondage of the old man. So there is a plan of evangelism. It, it incorporates first letting God's people go through a tough time for their sins so that they will cry out to him so that he will send a Savior. Now, he sent a Savior when Jesus came. He's sending Saviors when the man-child comes, too. So, you know, there's uh, approximately seven chapters in Judges where they go through this, this sequence of events time after time after time. It's a part of evangelism. You know, when the Word comes, God wants you to appreciate it. You know what happens when you go through a lot of misery for a long time and you hear the good news? It's like a drink of cold water to a thirsty man, right? He appreciates it, right? Well, I'm just going to read you just a few verses here. Just, But there's about seven chapters of this. Um, I'm going to start in Judges 3 and verse 7. It says, And the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served the Balaam. And the Balaam, of course, is a false Jesus. Um, and the Asherah, the false mother goddess, what some people call Mary, but it's not. Therefore the, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of uh, Kushan Rish Hatham, if I'm pronouncing that right, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served the same eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a Savior to the children of Israel, who saved them, even Othniel the son of Canaas, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. And he went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rish of them, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against the same. 
and uh, the land had rest 40 years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. And so he turned them over, basically, to another beast kingdom. And verse 15, And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a Savior, Ehud, so on and so forth. So you see, the Lord sends a lot of saviors. And once again, the people of God around the world, many worldly people who have been chosen from the foundation of the world to be members of the body of the bride, uh, many worldly people, and many people who are considered to be Christ but in the world, and in some cases just as lost, are crying out right now because of the misery, because of the things that they're going through. And and God is about to send a Savior. And he sent his messenger before this Savior's face. We know the Savior is, is only one, and that's Jesus Christ. He can be manifested in all those men that we read about in uh, Nehemiah and Judges, but it's still him. He comes in flesh. He comes in our flesh. He said, he that received you, receive of me. And because he was putting himself in his disciples through the word that he spoke, the words I speak in you, they are spirit and they are life. They are his spirit and his life. So, once again, God, through his word, is about to do the same thing, repeat history on a much larger scale, bringing forth a... John the, a corporate John the Baptist ministry, preparing the way for the coming of a corporate man-child ministry in whom Jesus lives. And it's all for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Praise be to God. Our great evangelism is about to go forth. It has a timing. Many people don't realize that. You know, Jesus said all that came before me were thieves and robbers. He was talking about the so-called ministers. God had prepared a timing to do this, and yet there were people going out to do it ahead of time. They were sent by men. They were sent by their own self-will, in many cases. Um, they were sent because they had the, the power and the money and the connections to go to their Pharisee Bible schools and come out and have authority over God's people. And so... So it is today. There are many that are out there that are on their own. They're doing their own thing. But there is a timing in this. And I'm convinced that the Lord has shown us so that we can cooperate with him in this timing. I would rather be in the Lord's will, wouldn't you? Well, going through all that suffering is where many of God's people are, but God is sending the answer right now. And you know, when Jesus came, there were many signs and wonders and miracles that relieved the people from their burdens. Uh, even Pharaoh said of Moses, who was a, a, a man-child, uh, that you deliver the people from their burdens. And um, that's exactly what he was doing. And that's what Jesus did, and that's what the man-child is going to do. A great evangelistic thrust is about to go forth. We want to cooperate with God. Uh, we want to be ministers of reconciliation. Let's go back to our text in Isaiah 40 and read a little bit more. The voice of one that crieth, Prepare ye in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Make level in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. You know, there are many people who have lifted themselves up that are going to be humble. And there are many people who have been humbled that are about to be lifted up by God. And um, this is going to bring about a great unity in the body of Christ, uh, a great destruction to the forces of uh, sectarianism and uh, religious denominationalism, as it was with Jesus. You know, those people that followed Jesus, those disciples that followed Jesus became one. They were one flock, one shepherd. And that's what's about to happen. Uh, among those who are anointed with the Holy Spirit, following those who are anointed with the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a great unity and a peace and a seeing eye to eye, as he speaks of later here. And the uneven shall be made level, 
and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Boy, what a promise. The glory of the Lord is coming straight at us, folks. And all flesh is going to know they won't all appreciate it, but they will all see it. All flesh shall see it together. You wonder why those Pharisees couldn't see it. You wonder why those scribes and theologians couldn't see it. The glory of the Lord. They saw it. The Romans saw it. Yes, they all saw it in Jesus Christ. But you wonder why they didn't recognize it. And... Uh, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It is coming. This is coming. I want to read to you a Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God hath appeared, literally it says, to all men bringing salvation. That's what the numeric says. But it's, there's a little turnabout in the ASV here, which the numeric straightens out, instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Well, I, I guarantee you this word of holiness is about to explode on the scene uh, from God's true ministers. You're not hearing a lot of it from those that have gone on their own, but uh, it's about to explode from God's true ministers because they're all holiness preachers, every one of them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, equate them with what we've known called as holiness preachers in the past because there was a lot of silly stuff involved there. But the truth is, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And living godly in this present world is necessary because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice that again. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory. Not the appearing of Jesus Christ, but the appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he says that this glory is going to be manifested in his people. will be seen in his people. And we behold in the mirror the glory of the Lord and are transformed into this same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord to Spirit. So if you see this glory in the mirror, it means it lives in you, right? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good works. Zealous. I remember when I first felt that. Zealous is for good works. Uh, it's, it's something that God puts in you. A desire to be well-pleasing unto Him. Just as I was once zealous to be a fool and to do my own will and to please my flesh, I received a new spirit that caused me to be zealous to do God's will. Praise God. And uh, it's sad that, that uh, so many of the ministries that are on the earth today will get that out of you very quickly, you know. Uh, back in Isaiah 40 and verse 6, it says, The voice of one saying, Cry. And one said, What shall I cry? All flesh is as grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the breath of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever. So, it is the word in us, the word made flesh, that is eternal. But the grass withereth, and the flower fadeth. When does that happen? Well, wintertime. He said, pray that your flight be not in winter, for then shall be great tribulation. In the wintertime, yes, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth. And tribulation has a way of crucifying the old flesh, 
the thing that stands in the way of the coming of the Lord in your life and the coming of the Lord corporately in his body is the flesh. And the Lord makes war with that old flesh. We're going to know this in the tribulation period. We're going to know a swift witness of the Lord against flesh and its works. A swift witness. Kind of like the Ammonites and Sapphira, right? A swift witness. So it's not all good news. It's it's some crucifixion. It's just good news. It truly is good news. But it's not painless news. And uh, we are going to go through what he said earlier about leveling the way in the desert. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be paid low. A humbling, a great humbling is coming to God's people. We're going to lose position in the world. We're going to re- lose respect in the world. How many of you know that most Christians want to be respected by the world, and yet God is not even going to permit it? He's not going to permit it. He is going to come against the old flesh. He's going to be. You're going to be hated of all nations for His namesake for this humbling to come to pass. But without this humbling, uh, the way for the Lord to come to his temple uh, is not going to be made manifest. You know, the Lord is coming in his first fruits temple, which is his man child, but also through repentance, the cry of repentance. You remember, you remember Jesus preached the exact same thing that John did. Do you remember that? The Bible says, from that time began Jesus to preach and to say, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John said the exact same words in chapter 3 and verse 2. So, this repentance is that humbling wherewith the Lord can come in his temple. He's coming in his first fruits temple, and he's coming in those who hear his first fruits temple and are ministered to by his first fruits temple. Even Jesus was bringing his own life in the lives of the people that he would preach to. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Without repentance, this is not possible. Without the, the flower fading and uh, the grass wilting, this is not going to be possible. So God has demanded this. We have to cooperate with him. It's not going to be a prosperity message. It's going to be the crucified life message. O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, get thee up on a high mountain. Think about that. Get thee up on a high mountain. Why would someone who is going to give good news get up on a high mountain? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, I would say it represents the kingdom of God. It represents holiness. It represents closeness to God. Farness from the earth, closeness to God. It represents a place where you can speak a long, long ways. It represents reach. I believe that God is going to give great reach to his ministers in these coming days. They're going to minister to the world. Get thee up on a high mountain. No, I think that um, Isaiah 52, let me read a few verses here, are speaking about this. Isaiah 52 and 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. Look, once again, we see the good tidings, the, the peace, the joy of the good news that we're going to be able to share with people. It's like you're wanting to give them a gift that's more precious than anything they've ever received, and you're so happy about it. Now, this should be our attitude uh, to the people that don't have it, both, uh, quote, Christians and, and non-Christians that don't have it. That saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. You know, they have not believed 
in the sovereignty of God. They have not believed in what he said he was able to do and would bring to pass. They have not believed. They need to hear this good news, that God reigns. He reigns over their enemy. He has made reconciliation. He has conquered the flesh. He has given us his life. The voice of the eye watchman, they lift up the voice. Together do they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord returneth to Zion. Praise the Lord. The first thing that God's going to do is restore his man-child, David, ministry in order to build Zion. And he says that the people in Zion are going to see eye to eye. There is going to be peace. There's going to be agreement. And there's going to be great joy. Together do they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord returneth to Zion. And so we see that the beginning of this return to Zion is the man-child ministry. He's raising up the Davids who are the head of Zion, who is the bride. Right? Uh, break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. This is the same good news that we saw in Isaiah 40. 1 and 2. He is uh, wanting his people to know that he is now here. He has come to answer their prayers. He has come to deliver them from their misery and their iniquity is pardoned. They have paid double for their sins and now they are receiving the acceptable year of the Lord. Praise be to God time when God is going to forgive his people and offer to them and give to them gifts freely and of course in hopes that they will be appreciative and continue to follow him as disciples not all did that but and not all will do it this time but this is this is what it is God is gifting to them in hopes that they will be appreciative and continue to follow in his footsteps as his disciples he can give a gift, but many people lose it very quickly. They lost it in Jesus' day because they didn't continue to walk as a disciple and value his words and, uh, and so on. So God's going to restore the waste places of Jerusalem, and meaning, of course, the bride. He's restoring the bride. We know from John that uh, Jerusalem represents the bride, represents a group of people. It's under King David. Uh, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. Uh, once again, the Lord is going to reveal his arm. Isaiah 53 says, Who hath believed our message? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? That was the coming of Jesus right in a body of the son of David once again he's doing the same thing uh, he may bear his only in other words he's going to reveal his power once again his power to save his power to deliver his power to meet the needs of his people and the Lord has made bear his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations they're all going to get to see this now they can deny it they can make excuses, but and some people, they don't believe even what their eyes show them. They don't believe, but God's going to do it. He's going to do it in front of the nations, just as he did it with Jesus. And, uh, and all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Cleanse yourself. This is, of course, speaking of spiritually coming out of Babylon, coming out of Egypt. This will be a time, a great time of deliverance for God's people when they see the Lord's holy arm made bare before their eyes. The strength of the Lord manifested once again as in the days of old. Have you ever heard people say, oh, why don't we ever get to see the parting of the Red Sea, the on and on and on, you know, these great miracles and so on and so forth. Well, we will. We will. He 
even then, you, you know, people saw the power go forth from Jesus, yet religious spirits blinded them to the fact of who he was. And the same thing is going to happen in our day, even though this will happen in front of the nations, in front of the heathen, <clears throat> many will not understand and they will not know. It still takes a gift from God to recognize Jesus, the real Jesus, not the false Jesus, but the real Jesus. So he says, go out from among them. When this thing happens, when the arm of the Lord is being revealed, God's people are going to come out of Egypt. Praise be to God. Cleanse yourselves, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. And that's what we do, too. We bear the vessels of the Lord's presence. For you shall not go out in haste, neither shall you go out by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear work. Oh, praise the Lord. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Like as many were astonished at thee, his vicious is Visage was so marred more than any man. That's the example, Jesus Christ, right? And his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they understand. And it's the same, of course, in the coming days, folks. What many people never knew was going to happen, even Christians never knew was going to happen, is about to happen. They're going to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Oh, glory to God. God's got great plans and great, exciting gifts to give to His people. And that's what this is all about. Many people love to um, point out the negative. The crucifixions only, you know. But God's got great gifts He's going to give to His people. Glory be to God. It's going to be a time of joy. And it's going to be a time of seeing eye to eye. And it's upon us. It's not somewhere in the far distant future anymore. It's upon us. And He says, going back to Isaiah 40, He says, O thou that tellest good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Why the cities of Judah? Because in the midst of Judah is the bride, right? God is choosing a bride out of Judah. And, uh, you know, like John the Baptist said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, right? Jesus Jesus, the man-child, was going forth to gather his bride. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord Jehovah will come as a mighty one. As a mighty one. Well, isn't he a mighty one? Well, of course he is. That's what God means, by the way, mighty one. He will come as a mighty one, and his arm will rule for him. And as you know, Jesus came as the arm of the Lord. And uh, let me read uh, 42, something very similar here, 42 and 13, uh, chapter 42, verse 13. It says this, The Lord will go forth as a mighty man. He will stir up the zeal like a man of war. He will cry, Yea, he will shout aloud. He will do mightily against his enemies. I have of a long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry out like a travailing woman. I will gasp and pant together. There's a time when God's people are going to be full of boldness. His man-child, his meek man-child, um, his humbled man-child is going to receive the boldness of the power of the anointing to go forth and cry out 
and to reveal to God's people these things. You don't imagine yourselves being like you are now. Uh, imagine yourselves with the anointing of the latter rain, uh, going forth as a mighty one with Christ in your heart. Uh, him being manifested in your very words uh, to reach out and touch and deliver and save his people. Hallelujah. And his arm will rule for him, back in 40 and 10. Uh, behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. You know, before the Lord comes, there there is a recompense. Many people are paying the price for their sins. They're discovering what sin is because they're reaping a very negative reward for it. But the Lord is going to say that their iniquity is pardoned. They have paid double, and this is the recompense that is before him, but he's got his reward with him. He is going to reward those who are humble towards him, He's going to reward those who have repented of their sins. He's going to give gifts unto men. Praise be to God. An awesome sign, wonder, miracle. He's going to go forth. I'm going to read uh, 62, Isaiah 62, and verse 11. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the ends of the earth, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. His reward is with him. Boy, the excitement, the joy that God's people had been laboring under the curse for so long when they met Jesus, when he opened blind eyes, when he loosed bound tongues, when he healed the lepers, when he met the needs, spiritual and physical, of the people of God. And we have just such a day coming, except it's going to be all over the earth. His reward is with him, his recompense before him, and they shall call them, notice this, <laughs> suddenly it's it was talking about the Lord, and now it says, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Well, that city has been forsaken for 2,000 years. You know, they've departed from the bride. They've departed from the city that's under King David. They've departed from it, and it's going to now be sought out by the people of God. And the redeemed of the Lord, praise the Lord. And I want to go back to um, chapter 40 and verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arm and carry them in his bosom and will gently lead those that have their young. Well, you know, the people of God have been handled rather roughly by the powers that be, but um, God's sending a people in humility, uh, good shepherds who have gone through the door, as Jesus said in John chapter 10, not come up some other way, who care for the sheep, and they're not hirelings. They have a love for God's people. This is what God is raising up, folks. And these are the ones that are going to be anointed, not the ones that are in it for their own pleasure, their own ego, their own uh, pocketbook, so on and so forth. God's going to anoint the good shepherd and uh, send them forth with his power and his blessings. It says he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather them, uh, the lambs in his arms. This reminds you of, um, of uh, Micah, chapter 5. So in, let me see, I'll start verse 3. It says, Therefore will he give them up until the time that she who travaileth hath brought forth. In other words, the 
man child has been birthed from the woman. He's going to give up Israel until his anointed apostle goes forth, is born from the woman. Uh, then the residue of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. The Lord Jesus himself is coming to feed his flock. What a happy day. And it's going to come when the man-child becomes, because that's how he's going to stand and feed his flock. And uh, he said seven shepherds would be raised up, and one in their midst, who I believe to be the Son of God, uh, eight principal men, he goes on to say, and this is how he's coming to feed his flock. The seven shepherds are for the seven churches. This is how he's going to feed his flock. He is coming. It, you know, they won't recognize him any better than they did the last time. Uh, that is the Pharisees and the people that have selfish ambition, but but those whose hearts have been prepared through repentance, uh, through the ministry of the uh, John the Baptist ministry or the Elijah ministry, these people will recognize him. And uh, the Lord himself is coming to minister. This is the, the, one of the happiest revelations I've ever received, you know, is that the Lord himself is coming to feed his flock, uh, to minister to his needy people, and he's going to lead them gently. And uh, you know, there's not going to be people that are just thrown aside because of their failures and their foolishness. You know, the rebellious, the uh, willfully disobedient, of course, they always fall aside. There's nothing you can do for them anyway. But those that are in failure, those that desire God and are joyful about goodness, even though they fail God, uh, these people are going to find a, uh, a willing vessel in the people in whom Jesus lives, in whom Jesus reaches out to minister to these people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it awesome? Folks, God's plan is beautiful. And he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and will gently lead those that have their young. Oh, glory be to God. Let me see. I'm going to read one more little piece here to you. In um, Isaiah 51, in verse 1, it says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you were hewn. In other words, we ought to look just like him, right? And to the the hole of the pit whence you were digged. Look unto Abraham, your father. Uh, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, Jesus said, right? And unto Sarah that bare you. For when he was but one, I called him, and I blessed him, and I made him many. For the Lord hath comforted Zion. He hath comforted all her waste places. He hath made her wilderness like Eden. This is good news, isn't it? He hath made her wilderness like Eden. is restoring. And her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Attend unto me, O my people. And give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall go forth from me, and I will establish my justice for a light of the peoples. Praise be to God. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the peoples. Arms, plural, shall judge the peoples. See, the arm of the Lord in Isaiah 53 was Jesus, but Jesus is coming in many people now, a corporate body of a man-child for, for a very large world, uh, shall judge the people. The isles shall wait for me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Notice this arm singular now. 
that they trust because it is Jesus that we trust. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, as in the days of old. Yes, as in the days of Jesus, for instance, and before, as in the days of old. The great things that the power of the Lord did in previous times are going to be multiplied in our day around the world. Yes, we will see the days of the power of the Son of God. The generations of ancient times. Is it not thou that didst cut Rahab in pieces, that didst pierce the monster? Is it not thou that driest up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that madest made us the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? God is going to smite the power of the old man when God's people pass over and enter into their wilderness. He is going to anoint them at the beginning of this time with the word of the Lord and the power of God, right? A way for the redeemed to pass over. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Once again, everything that's been taken from God's people is going to be restored. This is Joel prophesied. He prophesied it both in the former reign and in the latter rain is going to be restored. An everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That's great news, isn't it? Hallelujah. Okay, praise God. I think we run out of time here, but lots of good news. It's just a joy to study God's Word and see what He's about to do. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for this gift, Lord, and uh, please help us to understand and to cooperate with you in the coming of the Lord, in the coming of his great evangelistic move to shake the earth once more, to do a, a wonderful revival. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.